All right, sorry for that delay. Uh, let's go and have a word of prayer uh, before we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this uh, evening that you've given us. And I pray that as we are about to study your word, I pray that your spirit may be with us and teach us the lessons you want us to learn. And uh, I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We've been studying the book of Daniel and uh, we are halfway through the book of Daniel in the 12 chapters and today is chapter six. And when we complete chapter six, we are halfway through the book of Daniel. We have six more chapters and uh, very interesting chapters that are coming up um, that we will be looking at. But as we saw in Daniel chapter two, several presentations ago, one of the fundamental yet important line of prophecy is outlined in Daniel chapter two. And in Daniel chapter two, we find how Babylon, uh, it begins with the kingdom of Babylon. And after Babylon, Medo-Persia takes over. And after Medo-Persia, Greece takes over. Uh, and then Rome takes over. And then Europe uh, comes up the scene. And then we see how God establishes his everlasting kingdom uh, in this universe or in this world uh, in particular. But or as you follow or as you trace this major line of prophecy in Daniel chapter 2, we know that after Babylon would arise another kingdom. And that kingdom is the Middle Persian Empire. And last week, my friend Samuel, um, he, he took us through Daniel chapter 5. And in Daniel chapter 5, we notice how the Babylonian Empire, it comes to an end and the Medo-Persian Empire takes over. And so as we begin with Daniel chapter 6, or as we study Daniel chapter 6, we want to look at the last two verses of chapter 5, just so we can get a context of what is happening. Daniel chapter 5, verses um, 30 and 31. The Bible tells us, that very night, Belshazzar, not to be confused with Belteshazzar, uh, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. In Daniel chapter 5, it records the fall of the Babylonian Empire, just as Daniel chapter 2 prophesied. And Babylonian Empire comes to an end. Cyrus, being God's servant, he brings judgment upon Babylon. And Cyrus, he appoints Darius the Mede, one of the, Mede, uh, one of the Medes, to take over the province of Babylon. And so it is with this setting that we come to Daniel chapter 6. And in Daniel chapter 6, verses 1, 2, and 3, we read the following. It tells, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom and over these three governor, governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. And then verse three, then this Daniel, one of the governors, distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. And so we see that once Darius, he begins to rule the province of Babylon, he reorganizes the leadership model. And the way he organizes or reorganizes the leadership model is he has 120 princes over the province of Babylon. And these 120 princes, they were to give account to three governors in Babylon. And these three governors were under the king uh, of Babylon or under King Darius. And one among those governors, of the, one of the three governors was Daniel. It's amazing how Daniel, he was brought as a captive to Babylon. He is in Babylon as a student, and then he begins uh, his career as a, one of the wise men of Babylon, and then he becomes a chief of the wise men of Babylon. 
and then he sees the conversion of King Nebuchadnezzar. He sees how Nebuchadnezzar's grandson takes over Babylon and Babylon, um, the, the Babylonian empire or the Babylonian kings, they come to an end. And after that, the Medo-Persian empire is ruling, but still Daniel continues to serve the kingdoms there, but much higher than that, the kingdom of God. It's amazing how kingdoms rise and fall. Kings are throned and dethroned, but yet this godly man is still standing tall. Daniel at this point is 85 years old. Daniel is 85 years old when this reorganization takes place uh, of the province of Babylon and when Babylon comes uh, to an end. You know, like I told you in Daniel chapter one, Daniel is a student uh, in Babylon. In Daniel chapter two and four, he is one of the chief administrator in Babylon. In Daniel chapter five, he is remembered as a former highly placed officer in Babylon. It's very interesting that, um, that Daniel served King Nebuchadnezzar, did not serve his grandson, his Babylon, but then Daniel is serving uh, the Medo-Persian Empire when they were ruling uh, Babylon at that time. But the Bible tells us something very interesting about Daniel. In verse 3, the Bible tells us that this Daniel, one of the uh, governors of Babylon, distinguished himself above the governors and satraps. Why? Because an excellent spirit was in Daniel. And he had such an excellent spirit that the king was even thinking of setting him over the entire realm of, of Babylon. But this is not the first time that Daniel gets this compliment. In Daniel chapter 1 and verse 20, we notice that in all matters of uh, wisdom and understanding that Daniel and his friends were 10 times wiser. In Daniel chapter 4, we see how uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, when he has this dream of this tall tree that we studied about representing him, he brings Belteshazzar, uh, the Babylonian name for Daniel, he brings Belteshazzar before him to interpret the dream. And he tells Belteshazzar that the spirit of the holy God is in Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 5, even when Daniel was not serving Babylon, the mother of, um, of Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, the Bible tells, you know, when this handwriting on the wall takes place, pronouncing judgment about, against Babylon, when Belshazzar did not understand what was going on, when he was confused and nobody was able to help him, Belshazzar, Daniel was brought before Belshazzar, and the Bible tells in Daniel chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, how he was referred to. It tells, there is a man in your kingdom. This is the mother of Belshazzar talking. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of gods, were found in him. And Daniel... Uh, was found in him and King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, uh, your father, the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, in as much as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give. The interpretation. So we see here that Daniel, not just in chapter 6, but all throughout his life, from the time he began, or at least from the time he appears uh, in the scene of the Bible in Daniel chapter 1, from that time until this point in the history of his life, he's 85 years old now, even up till this point, the Bible recognizes Daniel as the man who has an excellent spirit. 
But we learned something, or at least I learned something very important from this, from the fact that, you know, Babylon was the major superpower at that time. And then Daniel was serving Babylon. But then Babylon, it comes to an end. Medo-Persia has taken over, but still Daniel continues to serve. And Daniel was, or he became Nebuchadnezzar's uh, close friend, if you please. And not just that, when the Medo-Persians took over, Darius had a very special friendship with Daniel. Daniel, he served the true God of heaven, but he maintained these friendships with these heathen kings without them influencing his relationship with God. And I think that is a very, very important lesson for us to learn in how we are to relate with people around us. People, those who don't have the same opinions like we do. People, those who don't do the same things like we do. How do we relate to them? How do we relate to them? You know, I, ha I had a privilege of getting to know one of the uh, of getting to know one of the spiritual giants that I've admired for a long time in the last few years of his life. And yes, I did admire him for a long time, but it was not until his memorial service, he, he passed away a few years ago, but it was not until the memorial service that I attended that I really understood what type of a man he was. You know, during his glory days, uh, when he was alive, he was a man who stood for some uh, or who defended some major biblical issues that were at stake at the time. And although he had opponents, although he, uh, you know, he spoke against issues that were not so good and he was speaking the truth. Yet he maintained a cordial relationship with people, those who did not think like him. He maintained a friendship that did not um, see things like him. And as I sat at his memorial, there were so many people who repeated this same thing over and over again. That although this man, you know, that I had the privilege of meeting, although this man disagreed or people disagreed with him, he respected people for who they were. He maintained friendship, although there was a difference in opinion. And Daniel, being a Hebrew, uh, a Hebrew person, and Daniel worshiping the God of heaven, unlike uh, Nebuchadnezzar and uh, other heathen officers, Daniel happened to maintain this cordial relationship uh, with these people. And that is why we see that over and over again, the Bible tells that Daniel had wisdom. Daniel had an excellent spirit. He had an amazing attitude when it comes to dealing with people. And that is something that we need to learn in the day and age that we live in. You know, one of my mentors, he recently said, and you know, it just, just made a lot of sense. He said, your attitude determines your altitude. Your attitude determines your altitude. What type of attitude do we have? Especially with people, those who don't think like us, those who don't see the way we do, or those who don't do the things we do. I mean, I'm not saying that we need to be influenced by them. All that I'm saying is how do we treat them? Do we have an excellent spirit like Daniel did in relating with people, in how he related with King Nebuchadnezzar, in how he related with Belshazzar, in how he related with Darius? An important lesson for us to learn. But Darius, looking at how amazing Daniel was and this excellent spirit that Daniel had, he wanted to make him as the next ruler over this entire realm. And this uh, excited the jealousy of Daniel's colleagues. The Bible tells in verses four and five. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find 
any charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Verse 5, then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning his law of God. You know, last week we saw how pride uh, of King Nebuchadnezzar led to the fall of King Nebuchadnezzar. But thankfully, praise God, that King Nebuchadnezzar, he repented of his sins. He humbled himself or God humbled and he repented and, his ga and he gave his heart to God. In Daniel chapter 6, we see another expression of sinful human nature, and that is jealousy. That is envy. And we will see as the story goes of where this jealousy and this envy of Daniel's colleagues lead them to. It was envy which killed Abel. It was envy, one of the reasons for Jesus to be killed. The Bible mentions in, uh, in the Gospels that he was handed over because of envy. He was handed over because of envy. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 30, the Bible tells, A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. But envy is rottenness to the bones. You see, my friends, there are different ways that our sinful human nature expresses itself. For King Nebuchadnezzar, it was pride. For Daniel's colleagues, it was envy or jealousy. Our own sinful nature, what is it exhibiting? Is it pride? Is it jealousy or envy? It is important that we observe and we ask God, Lord, what is it in my life that I'm struggling with? What is it in my life that I have to make things right with you? Daniel's colleagues had jealousy. And what they um, wanted to do, the Bible tells us that they wanted to find a, some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Some charge against Daniel concerning the work that Daniel was doing. But were they able to find anything? The Bible tells that they could not find anything because Daniel was faithful in his work. Daniel was faithful in his work. And when they could not find anything wrong with the work that Daniel was doing, it excited still further the jealousy and the hatred that was already within their heart. One of my friends, my, uh, one of my close friends, he's no more 25, but at the age of 25, at the age of 25, I'm not too far from 25, but at the age of 25, my friend was a principal of a school which he established. And I've often admired that, you know, at the age of 25, he had his own school. I mean, he was the principal and the founder of that school. And I wondered how he did it. But, you know, every place that he's worked at ever since, the one thing that he is complimented about is the faithfulness that he has towards the work that God had given him. The Bible tells in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 29 the following. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. And Daniel was one such person. Daniel, he excelled in the work that he did. And because he excelled in the work that he did, he stood before kings. He stood before Nebuchadnezzar. He stood before Belshazzar. He stands before Darius the Mede at this point in time. My friends, whatever work that God has given us, we are called to excel in it. We are called to do our best in it. No, there's a writer which writes the following, and it is very, very insightful. It tells, 
the experience of Daniel as a statesman in the kingdoms of Babylon and Medo-Persia reveals the truth that a businessman is not necessarily a designing policy man, but that he may be a man instructed by God at every step. His business transactions, when subjected to the closest scrutiny of his enemies, were found to be without one flaw. Talking about Daniel. Daniel was an example of what every businessman may become when his heart is converted and consecrated and when his motives are right in the sight of God. Now, this author is writing about businessman, but it applies to a teacher working in a school. It applies to a doctor, to a physician. Maybe he is treating patients with coronavirus. Maybe he's treating patients with cancer. It applies to preachers. It applies to, um, to CEO of companies. It applies to people working in the IT field of excelling in the work that God has given us. And there was no fault found in the work ethics of Daniel, he was so transparent in his work that he stood before kings and they were not able to find any fault. What is our testimony in our workplace? Now, sometimes we speak about Christian witnessing and how we ought to witness to unbelievers. And we tell how we ought to give them Bible studies and then talk to them about Jesus. And that is all good. We have to do it intentionally. But my friends, another way, an effective way, an essential way that we as Christians need to witness is in our workplace. It's the work ethics that we have. And I mean, I mean, I'm talking this to myself, you know, I want to be more faithful in the workplace that God has given me. And, you know, oftentimes we have this temptation of looking forward to where God is leading us next. We have this temptation of looking forward to how God is going to lead us in the next step that we fail to be faithful in the present. But the Bible teaches us. In the book of Daniel, yes, Daniel was concerned about the future of his people. Yes, Daniel was concerned about the future of this world. But yet he was faithful in the place where God had placed him. Now, are we faithful in the workplace that God has placed us? The jealousy of Daniel's colleagues not only led them to look at all the work of Daniel or his workplace, but it also led them to see his own personal life, his own personal life. They saw every single day, was, is there something, is there some flaw that we can find in Daniel? Is there something wrong that Daniel does that we can find a charge against him and tell it to the king? But Daniel was a man of integrity. Daniel was a man of integrity. The Bible tells us that they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. And then it tells, nor was any error or fault found in him. What an amazing testimony about Daniel. Now, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 23, verses 13 to 15, the following. It tells, then Pilate. When he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, this is, you know, when Jesus was taken from, from place to place, you know, he was about to be crucified, and different charges were against Jesus, and he was taken from one place to the other. The last few uh, days of Jesus, this is talking about before the crucifixion. And so Pilate, in verse 14, tells, said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, Having examined him, talking about Jesus, in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I send you back to him. And indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. Daniel in the book of Daniel, we find that his colleagues are looking at his work, uh, work related things, and they could not find any fault. Then they look at Daniel's personal life, and then they say, There is no fault that we can find in Daniel. 
And my friend, we come to the Gospels talking about Jesus when he is accused and taken before Pilate, when he is accused and taken before Herod. The testimony that Jesus leaves is that I have found no fault in this man. There was absolutely no fault in the life of Jesus. Daniel, he expressed same testimony that his master, the Lord Jesus, expressed when he was on his earth. But you know, in the end times, this story, this testimony will not only be the testimony of Daniel and his friends. This is not only going to be the testimony of Jesus Christ, but this testimony that there is no fault in this man or woman is also going to be the testimony of people living in the end of time, preparing for the second coming of Jesus. How do I know that? How do I know that? Revelation chapter 14, verses 4 and 5, it introduces to us uh, this group of people known as the 1,44,000 or 144,000. We're not going to go into the uh, number itself, but one of their characteristics. It tells in Revelation chapter 14, verses 4 and 5, the following. Talking about the uh, 144,000. tells, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. This is symbolically speaking. Uh, maybe in the future we will unpack all of that. Then it continues. These are the ones. Talking about these 1,44,000. These are the ones who follow the Lamb. Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God. Which was slain from the foundation of the world. Or you know, when John the Baptist looked at Jesus. He said, behold the Lamb of God. These are the ones who follow the Lamb. Wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was no deceit. And now notice, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The testimony of Daniel is that there was no fault found in Daniel. The testimony of Jesus is that there was no fault found in Jesus. And the testimony of God's end time people will be that there will be no fault of God's people in the end time. You know, I've often read that, uh, you know, the life of Daniel. And there are times when I'm reading through the life of Daniel that I've had to close the Bible, that I've had to close the book because guilt grips off my, takes over my heart. And I'm thinking, what kind of life have I lived? How can I live this faultless life that Daniel lived? How can you live this faultless life that Daniel lived, that Jesus lived? I've often also wondered, you know, obviously we've all made mistakes. But how is it that God's end time people will have a testimony which will tell that there is no fault in them before the throne of God? This is how, my friends, if you notice that verse carefully that we just read in Revelation chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. The Bible tells that these were redeemed from among men. What does it, does it mean that they were redeemed from among men? There was a point in time that they gave way to sin in their life. There was a point in time, yes, they cherished sin and they fell into sin and they were with fault. And they were a sinner before God. But by the grace of God, but by the mercy of God, by accepting the salvation that Jesus offered, they were redeemed from among men. And they were not only redeemed from among men. The Bible tells that they follow the lamb wherever he goes. What does that mean? It means that they do the same thing that Jesus did when he was on this earth. When they were to be tempted, they overcame temptation like Jesus did. They treated people like Jesus did. They spoke to um, the, the other people like Jesus did. They behave the way like Jesus did. And my friends, when we follow the example of Jesus, we can live a life without fault. But I want you to understand one thing important. We may have made mistakes in our life. We may have made wrong choices in our life. We may be at great fault because of the choices that we have made. 
But like Daniel, like Jesus, we can be without fault. How? By two ways. First, by accepting the gift of salvation that Jesus offers and finding forgiveness for the faults that we have done, for finding forgiveness for the sins that we have committed by accepting the grace of God expressed through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That is the first step to live a life without fault. The second is to follow the Lamb, that is to follow Jesus in every step of the way. We behold him in his private life. We behold him in his public life. And we ask God, Lord, please live out the life of Jesus in me. We don't follow preachers. Notice one thing very important, my friends. It tells us that they follow the Lamb. It doesn't say they are following preachers. It doesn't say that they are following, I don't know, some movie star or some, uh, some person uh, who sings great. They are not following anyone in this world. They are following Jesus Christ. And this is why they are without fault before the throne of God. I also want you to understand something. It specifies that they are without fault before the throne of God. What does that mean? There may be times that we will be with fault with people, but not against God because we follow God. And we will see that in the very life of Daniel himself. But as we go on in the story, they, you know, Daniel's colleagues, they say that we're not able to find any fault in his workplace. We're not able to find any fault in his personal life. We checked all of his history. There is nothing we can charge him against. But then they say in verse 5, then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. They tell Maybe, just maybe, Daniel's faithfulness to his God may be it. That, may tra that might trap Daniel. And so they begin to plot against Daniel. And it's very interesting that the Bible uses that, um, that they will find something against him concerning the law of his God. Because we find in Revelation chapter, um, chapter 12 and verse 17, the following. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, it tells, talking about Satan against God's church, God's end time people, it tells the following. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, in the end time, just like Daniel's colleagues were finding fault with Daniel because of his faithfulness to God's law, in the end time, you and I will be charged against falsely because we are following God's law. And down through history, God's 10 commandments God's law has been the center of this controversy between good and evil. And those who take side against God's law will be uh, charged against by uh, the people that will be against God's people. But we come to Daniel chapter uh, 6, starting from verse 6. They begin to plot. And all the way through Daniel 15, we see that how they are plotting that maybe Daniel is going to pray. Daniel is going to worship the true God of heaven. And what if, just what if, we come up with this plan and we tell King Darius, O oh king, for the next 30 days, no one worships nobody or anything except you. And Darius, whoa, I'm the king of this realm. It's quite a compliment that my governors, it's quite a compliment that my princes, they're coming to me and they're saying that they want to worship me and they want to influence the whole kingdom to worship me. So Darius signs this decree that nobody should worship anybody or anything except King Darius. The decree is, has been signed and Daniel, of course, being one of the governors, 
he comes to know about this, but how does Daniel react to this? We come to Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. And the Bible tells us, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before God, as was his custom since early days. Verse 11. Then these men, you know, Daniel's colleagues, assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. That's it, guys. That's it. Daniel is praying to his God when the law of the land tells that he's not supposed to pray to anyone. They are rejoicing over what was happening. And soon, with hurried steps, they go to the courts of of uh, King Darius, and they tell King Darius, King Darius, didn't you say that no one should worship anyone or anything except you? King Darius says, that's right, I did sign a decree about that. But you know, Daniel, he's worshiping his God. He's not worshiping you, he's worshiping his God. And then Darius understands the plans of these governors and these princes. And the Bible tells us that Darius had such a good friendship with Daniel that he was striving, he was finding all that he can to do some way or the other to rescue Daniel. But, they, uh, but he was not able to do that. We find a similar issue take place prior in Daniel chapter 3. It was not happening to Daniel, but to Daniel's three friends. But there are commonalities that we find in Daniel chapter 3 and in Daniel chapter 6. The first one is that the issue here is the issue of worship. In Daniel chapter 3, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar, he commands that everyone in the kingdom, they ought to worship this golden image that he built. But Daniel's friends, they say, we're going to be faithful to our God. We're not going to worship this golden idol. The issue is over worship in Daniel 3 and in Daniel 6. Second, a death decree is passed for disobeying the law of the land. In Daniel chapter 3, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar tells those who don't worship this golden image will be thrown into the fiery furnace. Well, uh, Daniel's three friends, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. In Daniel chapter 6, a death decree, they will be thrown into the lion's den. My friends, in the end time, we will say that later on, in fact, in the upcoming chapters, in the end time, it's gonna, the issue is going to revolve around the issue of worship. And there will be a death decree that will be passed. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 17, we read the following. Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 17. It tells, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and now notice, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. We will study later on who the beast uh, of Revelation is. It is very much linked with um, the book of Daniel. And so we see that the issue in the end time that you and I will face is the issue over who will we worship. And then if you come down to verse 15, the Bible tells, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the beast, the image of the beast to be killed. A death decree. Those who won't worship the beast, they would be killed, just as in Daniel chapter 3 and in Daniel chapter 6. How are we to respond to this as God's people? My friends, we are to respond to these things just like Daniel did. Daniel and his friends faced an issue over worship. You and I will face an issue over worship in the end time. Daniel and his friends faced a death decree for disobeying and being faithful to God. You and I will face uh, a death decree 
for disobeying what they say and being faithful to God. But like Daniel, we are to be faithful to God that even the death decree could not stop Daniel from praying. You know, the Bible tells that as his custom was since the early days, it's not all of a sudden that Daniel had this faith. It's not all of a sudden that Daniel was having this relationship with God. It was not all of a sudden that he was praying since his early days. From the time there was peace and prosperity, Daniel was faithful to God. You know, my friends, you and I can be faithful to God in the end time when we face these issues, when we are faithful to him now, when there is peace, when there is peace. And also I want you to understand that not even a death decree could stop Daniel from praying. And that shows us the importance of prayer life that you and I need to have. The importance of prayer life that you and I need to have. Is it work that is stopping us from praying? Is it studies that is stopping us from praying? Or is it, I don't know, entertainment that is stopping us from praying? What is it that is blocking your prayer life to ascend, to lift up your soul up to the God of heaven? Not even the death decree could stop Daniel. You and I should not let anything in this world to stop us from worshiping the God of heaven. You know, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, the following. And then I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, now notice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of waters. God is calling his people in the end time to worship not the created, but the creator. God is calling you and me in the end time to worship him alone and not to worship anything else. You know, just like Daniel, you and I are to worship the God of heaven alone. What was the consequence? Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. And the Bible tells us that the lions did not touch Daniel. The lions did not touch Daniel. King Darius, after he throws Daniel into the lion's den, he doesn't have peace in the night. He doesn't want music. He doesn't want good food. He's fasting. He's thinking about Daniel. What is going to happen to my friend? A man of such integrity, a man of such honesty, a man of such faithfulness. He's feeling bad that he put his friend into a situation. He's fasting and he's thinking. But the next day, the first thing that he does when, when, when the sun rises is that he goes to the lion's den and he asks Daniel, Daniel, are you alive? Has your God saved you? You know, I want to read that verse um, uh, right here in Daniel chapter 6 and then verse 20. It tells, verse 19, starting from verse 19, it tells, Then the king arose at dawn, at the break of the day, and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, Darius knew that, yes, he served Babylon. Darius knew that he is serving Medo-Persia. But Darius knew that above everything, he was a servant of the living God. Has your God, whom you constantly serve, what a testimony that you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Verse 21. Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king. Live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me, inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. And also toward you, O king, I committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury, whatever whatever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. What is it that saved Daniel? 
It was Daniel's faith in God that saved Daniel. It was God who saved Daniel. Daniel honored God in front of everyone. And God honored Daniel in front of the entire nation. You know, sometimes God allows us to go through allows us to go through the fiery furnace. Sometimes God allows us to go through the lion's den, but he does it with his guiding arms around us, his protecting arms around us. You know, the Bible tells in the book of Psalm chapter 91, verses 11 through 16, the following, and he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands, they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot because he has set his love upon you. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high. The Bible tells us that God will deliver us, that the angels of God that protected Daniel from the lions is able to protect you. you know, the Bible tells in the book of um, Peter, uh, that uh, in the book of Peter, that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Today, are you going through a lion's den in your life? Are the lions roaring loudly in your life? The good news is God's angels will keep you. The good news is God's angels will protect you. And so, my friends, as we come to a close, We've finished the historical portion of the book of Daniel. And there's an interesting pattern that we've seen throughout these six chapters. The pattern is the chapter begins with a crisis in their life, in the life of Daniel and his friends. But it ends with the God of heaven being defended. And in chapters 7 through 12, it's going to talk to us about the crisis that you and I will face in the end time. But my prayer is that we will exhibit the faith that Daniel and his friends exhibited during those times of crisis that we will talk about in the next six chapters. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for Daniel and his friends and for their faithfulness. Help us to be faithful to you like Daniel and his friends. Help us to feel your presence with us. Father, help us to remember that God is first in everything and before everyone. Give us the integrity of Daniel. Give us the faithfulness of Daniel. Give us that life without fault like Daniel. Give us that courage like Daniel. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we are going to study about the end time prophecies, starting from Daniel chapter 7 through 12, that you will not only teach us what is about to take place, but you'll also inspire us, the faithfulness of Daniel and of Jesus Christ within our hearts. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.